Well, let's, um, let me just pray again and then we're going to um, just jump into sharing a few little thoughts of my journey that may encourage you tonight. Well, hopefully will. Yes, Lord, we, give, we just ask you to lead us tonight. God, over this next 30 minutes, we ask you to lead us by your spirit. God, that we might leave this place knowing that you are real and that you're alive and that you're a living God and that you love to touch the lives of whoever calls on your name. Mm. So, Father, we give you thanks. We give you wonderful thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've got to be a little bit careful with what I share tonight because mum's in the room. (laughs) And I will just say that there are things in my life that I can't share, and I think most of us have testimonies like that that as you journey through life, you're, there are things that, that get so deep inside of you, you can't actually share them because it'll uncover other people. There's other folk around you that you just, you'd love to share that story, but um, you just have to let some of those go. In the early days, the more that happened to me, the greater it was because it was a good story. But in the end, they actually pull you up. So you can't actually share everything that you want to share. But uh, so anyway, we'll kick it off from. Um, I was born 1963. I was born. I'm 52 years old. Yeah, hey, good on you, Camo. You're there. So I was born in New South, but he was born in New Zealand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Over on the uh, the the Iron Ore Beach. Um, but. 1963, I was born, born here in Orange, and we are just talking the other day to my uncle. We've been in, in Australia since 19, just after 1900. Granddad actually, my granddad was born in 1900, but he actually wasn't born in Orange. He came here. So, um, but we've been here for 100 years. 100 years we've been in the city, so we, that's why, you know, people, people say good day to us. It's because we've been here for so long. You know, so people just get to know you. You know, you're one of the whites, you know, so that's how that whole show works. But I grew up in the Brethren, uh, exclusive Brethren Church, or the Plymouth Brethren Church that you may have heard of. Um, a lot of different strands through the Plymouth Brethren Church, but I remember in that, I remember in that fellowship, I, also, I really, one of the thoughts that was strong in that fellowship was I, I remember a lot of conflict. I remember continual conflict as I look back at my early seven years. So I just remember there just seemed to be conflict all the time. I remember we used to go to the, um, the early morning meeting was at six o'clock and, and I just remember dad being really angry on the way to that meeting most days. You know, it just because he was, my dad was a bit of a rebel so he didn't really like fitting in with systems very good. And, um, but I remember that, but, I, but at the age of seven we left that Movement, and when we left that, when we left that, it was there was a, quite a major division through the through the body through the church at that time. But I remember, I remember the heartache of that hour. I remember as a seven-year-old boy, I remember that we lost we lost our whole family in one meeting. We had, I still had mum, and I had my dad and my two brothers, but we would lost the whole bag of all our cousins, our grandma, all of those people. They were gone from that day onwards, and we never ever restored that. So um, after, how old am I now? 52, for less seven, that's how many years ago. So we never ever went back to the church, so we never ever restored those friendships. So I, I remember it being a very difficult time. Now, now one of the things that's interesting, as a, as a brethren person, we even as little kids, you know, you, we always, you know, you always went through life so different than the rest of the people. Now, when we got out of the church, we weren't, we still, I don't know how many years this went on for, but we were never really allowed to mix it with the worldly crowd. So it left us, our family bonded pretty tight. And uh, my dad got to a point, dad got pretty possessive, and that's why when we actually got to the point where we, where we all married or got wives, that dad didn't go much on any of the women and uh, was very much against her, in fact, <laughs> on one particular occasion, Dad said, don't bring her into the house, you can leave her in the car. And I remember, I remember going inside there and just having half an hour in home, but, Jeff, but Beth wasn't let out of the car because he was just, he was just hard like that. But, the, but why was he like that? was because he had, 
He'd lost everything in his early days, you see. So he'd become possessive and made sure that that would never happen again. So he tried to hang on to um, what he thought he had. But my love for Beth was much greater than my love for Dad. And so we you know, we got married. But there was probably about 12 months there that I was very careful about going to the house because um, you know it was a bit difficult for Beth. But as time went on, Dad got softer. And, and I will say, at the end of his life, Dad was a very tender man and really restored everything that was broken. God is a God of restoration. He really is. He, he is a God of restoration if you'll let him do it. But, but you know, the Lord really softened Dad's heart, particularly in the last three months. He became a beautiful man, a very beautiful man. So, <clears throat> so I remember that. I remember at school that we were never allowed to, you know, really to eat with the rest of the kids. And I don't even know why that really was. But we'd, I remember we'd, we'd eat our lunch and... Uh, and I even remember on when we first got out of the church, Mum would often come up in the car and we'd sit out the front of the school and have lunch in the car. You remember those old days, Mum? That, <laughs> you know, so we, we actually would sit because we weren't allowed to eat with the commoners, you know. But one of the funny things that was established in all of that is that you'd get this whole, this, this whole picture. I actually thought I was better than everybody else. You get a bit of an image, you know. You think, well, you know... And you actually feel that place of, um, you know, <laughs> I don't like, m- mum used to often say it to us, you know, I don't want to brag, but by golly, I'm good. You know, that was the sort of attitude that we had a bit. But mum was always clipping us, trying to get us to settle down. But at the age of, so seven, eight, nine and ten, we joined the Baptist church. Um, I'm just not sure how, what age that was. But, you know, the, the things that affect you as a child, and, and Beth does this ministry so well, the things that affect you of a child are really the problem later on in life. Those deep scars that happen there and you think to yourself, <clears throat> you know, well, I'm older now, I'm over it, I can get... Well, you mightn't be. You know, we'd been married, Beth and I had been married for um, probably 20 years and uh, we, went for a, we went for a little holiday over to um, Abba, uh, where did we go to? To Oberon Dam. Went over to Oberon, had a weekend in Oberon, well close to home in case the kids run into trouble so we could shoot back home. But I went to Oberon Dam and I remember we drove into this dam and I was overwhelmed with this loneliness. I felt this loneliness had come over me and I thought, what on earth is this? And I said to Beth, I said, are you feeling this? I'm just thinking it's a territorial spirit here. <laughs> There's a spirit over this place. This is, you know, someone's died here. This is bad. And I could feel this and I, and I didn't have a clue what was going on with me. And when I got home, I remember I went and saw Mum, and you might remember this, Mum. I said, Mum, what, what? I went to Abron Dam today, uh, yesterday, and I felt I was overwhelmed with sorrow. And now this is I'm talking. I was, I was. So here I am now. I'm, you know, probably forty when at that stage. And uh, Mum said that was the first Sunday that we weren't at church. We Dad took us all out for a picnic, so that we didn't have to, you know, so we didn't have to sit at home crying about not having any friends. So Dad took us for a picnic over there and I went there, t- over on Dam, went there 25 years later. I don't remember that day at all. I've got no memory of that day. But I drove into that place and a memory occasions hit me and I'm overcome with grief. I didn't know what it was all about. But I've said to, I asked Mum and she said, yeah, that was, the, that was our first little day out when we left the church, you know. So that loneliness hit me there because, um, so the little scars like that actually mark you. They mark you, this is why you've got to get free and get full of God. Because if we're left to, you know, where man is, it's horrible. It's a terrible place. Anyway, good news, at the age of 10, I got wonderfully born again. My brother Jeff went to a camp and uh, we joined the Baptist church. We'd become pretty close to the Baptist guys. (coughs) And uh, Jeff came home from a camp and basically said to me, Tim, um, God's actually going to forget about you. (laughs) His theology was really... We're off the wall, but man, he got me. I tell you, he hit me hard. He said, you know what? He said, your heart will get that hard. You'll be like Pharaoh. You'll be just like Pharaoh. Because we knew all the Bible stories. My mother would sit at the end of our bed every night. We'd have a verse of a chapter of Blinky Bill or Winnie the Pooh, but we'd always have our Bible devotion and our prayer. That happened every night. So by the time I was 10, I knew the Bible had confluently quote the book of Psalms. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, a couple of verses anyway. And actually, we used to get paid. We used to get paid if we learned a, ver- learned a chapter. Uh, we'd get money, you know. I don't know how much money it was. 
probably wasn't a whole lot, but it was. Um, but that was that was it. So we learned all the little short chapters first, you know, the <laughs> tiny ones. We never got to Psalm 119. <laughs> So that's how we learned all that. But I remember, I remember, um, I remember uh, we, we knew the Bible well. And, the stories, and I, just, I just assumed I was saved. I just thought, I'm sort of one of God's, I'm right. But my brother got home from that camp and said, if you don't give your life to Jesus, you're actually going to hell. And I had an incredible, overwhelming, just an experience that I was lost. I never, never felt that before in my life. But I felt like I'm actually lost. And I said, well, what have I got to do, Jeff? He said, you need to go into your bedroom and ask Jesus to come into your life. You know, and I did. I just shot into my bedroom there. I was only lost for about five seconds, man. I don't know, probably a couple of minutes. But I remember going into that bedroom, kneeling down and salvation. That was my first real encounter with God that day. And from that day on, it didn't matter what people said, what people did. No matter, I knew that God was real. He was alive. He was living. And everything mum had said was actually right. It's real. This stuff is alive and living and it's real. And I want to encourage you tonight, you know, that God is alive and he's living. You might be in a season right now even where you feel like, God, where are you? Why is life like this? I want you to hear tonight that God is alive and he's living and he's real. And he will help you through the journey of life. You might feel like the light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming, but I tell you, it's a whole new day that's coming towards you. That's the truth. He's doing it. So the age of 10, I was born again. I was just this afternoon trying to put together a few of my little thoughts of the divine encounters. A man said to me one day, he's, he was sharing his heart with me, he said, but you wouldn't understand any of this, Tim, he said, because you're a pastor, like you've been like God's chosen and you've really had nothing ever go wrong for you. You know, you're just like, oh, he's a preacher, he's just got God's divine past. Well, if you want to experience that, become a preacher for a little while and feel the weight of that path. Uh, let me tell you that the enemy hates him more than anybody else. And he's out to destroy your life. Really appreciate the saints praying for us. I really do. So um, went through my teenage years. Never really rebellious. My dad um, used to. My dad used to smoke and drink. But dad was drinking was never an issue to our family. I never felt that drink was a sin. Smoking a cigarette was bad. If mum caught that, I was going to be in heap of trouble. But but drink was okay. You know we were. I don't know how young we were. We all have a sip of dad's beer. That was never a problem to me. We joined the Baptist church. They had a different point of view. <laughs> but <laughs> but, um, but I, we, I never had any problems at all. I remember the old KB beer cans we used to set up as pyramids. I'd shoot them all with a slug gun and target practice. <laughs> You're getting some story here, aren't you? So, you know, I remember that. You know, we used to shoot them all down with a slug gun and Jeff would throw a rock at them and knock them all over just to wreck me. <laughs> but that's what he was like. Um, yeah, so, so that was no trouble. So in my teenage years, we drank. As I got older, I drank. No, I never really got drunk. Probably a couple of times I'd had a bit too much. Um, yeah, a couple of times I did. But I, and we, I, and we smoked a little bit. Not, not, it was always sort of a bit on the side. Driving trucks and stuff like that, you know, it was always pretty fun having a cigarette. But... Uh, yeah, never really, but I never ever really felt guilty. I never, I never battled condemnation like people do today. It's funny, you know, you can be doing a lot of stuff wrong, but I just knew I had the favour of God on me. I never really felt like I was in trouble. But uh, so through my later teenage years, did all that, but I did get away from God. I drifted towards, I'd done an apprenticeship as a fitter machinist, fell in love with Beth at the age of 17. She was 18, she's a year older than me. I fell in love at the age of just... 17 turning 18 and uh, ruined my plans. I was actually going to Uland coal mine. That was my dream. I was going to go over there and work real hard for five years and come home a very rich man with a couple of houses because you could buy a house then for 30 grand. All right, you can, and you could get on five or six hundred dollars a week back in those days and buy a house for 30 grand. So, you know, in 12 months you could pay for a house off. It was incredible. Lot much harder today. But I fell in love and I, the whole plans changed. And if I hadn't have fallen in love with Beth, I don't know where my life would have been. I know that I have helped her enormously, but she has helped me incredibly as well. You know, it's, we've changed. We, we've really been able to change each other. So the ages through those teenage years, we went to church because we had to. I met her actually in church at the Baptist church. She used to sneak up the back. For, so when her mother rang from Sydney, she could say, yeah, I went to church tonight, Mum. That's why she used to do it. But... Um, so we didn't get to church very often. But when we got engaged and got married, 
I remember saying to the Lord, I, when I, I encountered God at the age of 10 and I'd never ever really felt that encounter um, since that day. I'd never really felt that peace and the love like that day. So I, I, when we got married, I thought, well, we've got to settle down here and get our lives sorted. So I came back to God. I remember praying again, get my prayer life going again. And, uh, you know, just, you know, Lord, here I am, I'm back, I'm doing it, I'm ready for you. What do you want to do, you know? And, and heaven was silent. I never heard a word from heaven. And uh, my first couple of, couple of days at prayer, I thought, wow, I think I've offended God. I really felt because, of, and I didn't know why he wasn't coming to me like I used to be able to experience. It was, look, I, I could control God in my early days, but it was like he'd silenced somehow. And so um, weeks went on in this prayer. And by the end of three months, I was getting, I'm starting to think, surely I haven't <laughs> blasphemed the Holy Spirit and God's left me. So there was a desperation started to come into my soul. And uh, I'd just been married. And so God, and I cried out to God. I said, God, I'll serve you. I promise I'll serve you. Don't ever leave me. And I, I remember reading Psalms with David, you know, don't cast me away from your presence, oh God. And, um, and that night, I had a visitation from Jesus again. And he grabbed me and he said this. He said, he said, are you serious this time? I said, I'm as serious as I'll ever be. And so that was my point. I surrendered right there in his presence. And, and, and it, we started to go from there, back on track. Um, I went into then a season of enormous fears. There's no little kids here tonight. I went into, Beth, Beth had enormous fear. And I'm looking back at it now, that old house in March Street. I think there was a... I think it was a there was a spirit over the home, and um, but you see, see as you journey through life, you have to conquer every fear that comes at you. You've got to learn to be able to break everything, and so you you look at a preacher today and you think, well, you know, he seems like he's going well. You've got no idea what people have had to overcome, and you can't ever judge a person because you don't know what their shoes feel like. You've never walked in those boots. You don't know the journey. But I remember for 12 months because Beth was that fearful. And, and so that was one of the, my biggest torments. I hated the fear that would just control her. It would be so controlling it wouldn't control me. So I couldn't, I was not free to be able to do anything because she would, it became across to me as enormous control. So whenever she said, oh, don't leave me, I need to, I'm too scared. You know, and so, oh, and I was just bound beside her. She became very possessive and I had to walk with her um, because of this fear. And so... I'd gone to a little Bible study and um, out of that, I don't know how it came, but a spirit of fear entered me. And all of a sudden, I was fighting what Beth was fighting. Now, Beth was doing night shift as a nurse at the hospital, so I had to have all my nights, I'm, a, I'm on my own. I've grown up in a family, never on my own. Always had family around me. And I had fear and I knew that I was fighting something. I'm, I got God and I knew I had God. And then uh, and one night, one night about midnight, I, I woke up in bed, best at work, and here's this spirit standing at the end of my bed. And I've, got, I've just gone cold all over, and I've just shut my eyes and flicked under the covers, and this thing's walked around the side of the bed and just slapped me. And for the, the next 12 months, you've got no idea what I fought. The next 12 months, <coughs> it was just, it was just hell, man. I just fought this thing and fought this thing. It never, ever came back to my room. I never ever encountered it at that level. And I look back at it today, and if that was the worst thing that ever ha had been the worst thing, it would have been easy. Things got way worse than that. You know? <laughs> but at that point, I remember having to learn how to fight fear. And, I, and so I had a sympathy towards Beth from that day on because I knew what she was actually wrestling. Now, she picked up a spirit of fear at a horror movie. I think that was right, Beth, wasn't it? A horror movie. She idiot took her to a horror movie and she picked up a spirit of fear. But what was over that house, I still think now that it was something over that home. You know, we just bought a house and thought everything was right and I had no idea about house cleansing then. We, we weren't called Ghostbusters in those days. We didn't know nothing about them. Anyway, wrestled that thing and came through it. We went, we were at the Baptist church at that time and a Pentecostal guy came to our church. Now, I'm not spirit filled at this stage. I've encountered God. I love God. I want God. I'm hungry for God. I'm a zealot. I'm after everything that God's got. And we had a Pentecostal guy join the Baptist church and he said, you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, you don't know nothing. You think, oh, I haven't got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I didn't really know too much about it. He said, do you talk in tongues? I said, 
I don't know, I've never heard about tongues. What are they? He said, well, when you, when you talk in tongues, you'll be baptised in the Holy Spirit. And I remember saying to him, his name's Andrew, I said, I said are you baptised in the Holy Spirit? He said, no, I'm not either. But I know, but I know you're not, you know. <laughs> and so well, that's a great help. So for the next two weeks, I sought God. I said, God, is there more in heaven? I didn't know. So I started to seek God. And I said, seek him for this baptism. And so we're actually in the book of James, of all things. We're doing a Bible study in the book of James about two weeks after that word. And uh, I'm seeking the Lord for this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, in the middle of James, this guy actually put the bounce on me. He was the one running the study, wasn't he, that night? And I got stuck in Romans. That's right. I got, he's, he's reading in James and I'm stuck in the book of Romans. And I'm reading about the Holy Spirit, of that same Spirit that dwells in you, of that same Spirit, all that stuff in Romans 8. And I thought, oh, I can't believe this. All of a sudden the room just filled up with the power of God. And the Spirit of the Lord came straight down through the middle of the room, as clear, as clear as anything. All the people on this side got absolutely touched by the power of God. The people on this side left the building, left the house, and I never saw them again. It was just, so, I just can't believe that it went like that. And those people just should have wished they were on the other side of the room because they were all Baptists. I was in a Baptist hall, in a Baptist, um, we were youth leaders at the Baptist church. And the Spirit of God, and out of my mouth came this river of tongues, river of tongues. out, and Because I'm Baptist and I'm not even understanding this stuff, but it's flowing out of my mouth. I put my hand over the mouth and uh, came out of that little, that little encounter. Where that led me to, was after that I, I fought enormous pride. I just felt now that I was baptised in the Holy Ghost, <laughs> how important am I to the world? <laughs> and I, I, I didn't think, wow, well, I'm going to humble myself here. I just thought, this is it. I'm like, I'm the chosen one. I am it. You know, and that's how I started to feel. So we taught the Baptist church at that level, started to teach the baptism of the Holy Spirit from the pulpit at the Baptist church, upset a few folk there in the church and they got a new youth leader came in and started to quiz me and eventually we left that church, went to a little house church for six years. Now Beth was really nervous that night. She said, what's happened to you? I said, I've been baptised in the Holy Spirit. Now she'd been taught that if you speak in tongues, you've picked up a devil. You see? So here's the stuff we're wrestling. I'm talking in tongues and she's now thinking, well, if you're talking in tongues, you know, so... So we, there was tension in the house at that time, enormous. And uh, Beth read a book in the end and got really touched of the saw because she didn't even know if she was saved, really. And because I was an old brethren, I, um, you know, women really didn't have much of a place. Yeah, so in our prayer times, Beth, I wouldn't let her pray. I'd said, I'll pray and you'll listen, that's how it'll work. And um, <laughs> I was pretty, I know, you know what I'm thinking, I'm just doing everything right. I didn't know, I'm just thinking, you know, I've got the glory here, you got nothing, but you just listen and, and I'll lead you through life, you know. And uh, so we, that baptism of the Spirit that came that night led me into enormous pride. Isn't it amazing that God can come and touch you and fill you with power <laughs> and all of a sudden you take it to yourself and just think you're the man. Well, that opened me up to no one really understood me. The Baptist church couldn't handle me. I was preaching one night. I was like, I'm, I'm having amazing encounters with God, too many to mention and too many and things that I promised to the Lord that I'd never share if he would do this for me and things that I'd say, Lord, if you'll just do this, I'll never tell the world about it, you know, and I have those stories, but they're locked away in me and I've, I've honoured those things. But I remember um, one night in the Baptist church, I was preaching on the Holy Ghost. And because we did youth services there every Sunday night with the youth pastors or the youth leaders. And all of a sudden, I was taken out of my body while I'm preaching. I'm preaching to the people. And all of a sudden, I'm taken out of my body. And I'm out the back in the little, in the little um, beside the baptism of the little office. I'm sitting out there. I've got, there's a little table like that. I've got Jesus in the chair on the other side, right? And he's, and he's, and I'm sitting in this chair here. And I'm saying to Jesus, I said, Lord, I can't teach this. They're going to throw me out of this place. If I teach any of this stuff, and I could hear myself preaching full on out the front. And I'm, I'm out the back about as far as that. And I could hear myself clearly preaching out the front. And, and they call it, I've learned about it today, it's called bilocating. 
bilocating. So I'm out here. I'm with Jesus, saying, "I don't, Lord, I don't want to do this. Oh, please, please, I'm, you know, like I'm already on the thin edge of the wedge here at this church. Don't do this to me." I'm feeling. He said, "You'll teach what I." And, and I'm having this this wrestle with Jesus. I, I don't remember what he looked like, but I know that that encounter. Now, where was I? I was actually with Jesus, but my body was out the front. My body was left here. But if, if you ask me where I was, I was, I'd gone with that bloke out the back. And that's where I was having that encounter. All of a sudden, I'm just dropped back in my body. And, and I'm here preaching up in the middle of it all. And I haven't got a clue where I'm going because I'm dropped back in my body. I had to get the tape to hear what I actually preached that night because I'd had that encounter probably for a couple of minutes out the back. And you know what? I give them all a serve. I give the church a ripman. So here I am, a legalist. I'm full of myself, and yet I'm still having these incredible encounters with God. And so gift does that. You know, but character doesn't... Character's the error that really, you know, when you can't handle that stuff. But the gift, actually, God's still got a call in your life to do it. And I've watched this over and over again. You see people with a call in their life, they're still encountering God incredibly. And yet you can't even have a cup of tea with them. And that's full of himself, you know. And yet they're encountering God amazingly. And just hang in there because God hasn't finished with them. <laughs> There's some edges about to come off them. So, um, so that was just one little encounter. Out of that, that led us into a house church. Went to a little home church with half a dozen people. And there we started to learn who the Holy Spirit was. I was at church every day. And I was hungry to know that Bible. I I wanted to know everything there was. I wanted to have the second coming worked out. I wanted to know everything. When people said a word, I wanted to know what it meant. And so I studied and studied and studied for in that six years in that little house church. Well, it came, it was 1993 now. 1993, I went to, I'm really self-righteous now. I'm full of myself and everything I'm reading the Bible is just confirming more and more where I am. That's why it's very hard to unlock someone with religion. It's the most dangerous demon you'll ever get, a spirit of religion, because everything people tell you, it'll, it just confirms you that you're right. And so when someone says, well, you're an idiot, mate. You're an idiot. You're just full of yourself. You just, all you'd say to yourself is, yeah, well, the Lord told me that persecution was coming today. So it confirms you all the time. You know, and if they say something that encourages you, you know, all it does is build your pride. It's a dangerous devil. And it's only the Spirit of God that can unlock, unlock that. And I don't know who was really praying for me, but, but someone must have been covering me. But I was hungry for God in all of this. 1993, I went to a little camp meeting out at Alec Town. Some of you might know Harry Westcott out there. Bishop Harry, and he had Col Urquhart was the preacher. And Col Urquhart was a man of God. He'd had a, he built a church of about 10,000. And I'm out there with, actually was Jeff Pierce, the guy that sung today down in the park. Jeff had just come to the Lord. He hadn't met Karen at that, he wasn't married to Karen at that stage, but he was a bit of a friendship starting to start. And I asked, um, and I went to this camp. I would never go to this. I'm in a house church, member. I don't have anything to do with the rest of the world because we're the only people that are right. I, I did street evangelism. I did door knocking. I did everything. But it was very much from a place of where right, you're wrong. And I'm here to help you if you want to cross over. You know, little to say that not one person ever crossed over. <laughs> down, down the street, you know, be preaching up Sunday afternoons in the back of an old ute with a PA system. I'd be preaching hell as hot as I could get it and heaven as good as I could get it. You know, but um, the only thing that ever did was just stir people up and, you know, peg a bit of stuff at you on their way past. Abuse you, blast the horn and give it to you, you know. Um, bless you, sir. Bless you, you know, it was good. But it was all religion. I was tied by it, but there was a love for God in all of this. I still wanted the kingdom to come somehow. Anyway, 1993, I've gone up there with Jeff Pierce to keep an eye on him so that he didn't get into any false teaching. Jeff was not in my church. We didn't know Jeff was in the house church. And I've gone up there with my little list. And I had, because um, I've got a, I know how a preacher should be. I know what they should be talking about. I know he's got to be talking about the blood. He's got to be able to talk about what's in the atonement. I've got all this checklist for him. I'm waiting on this. And so the preacher starts to preach. And his first sermon, I had nothing on the page. I thought, wow, this is interesting. I know I'm the only person in the world that's right. But I might be finding another guy here. There could be another person that's actually got it together. This is how I'm thinking. Second night, or the second sermon he preaches, he's preaching again, I'm ready with the list, and very critical, very critical, wait, just waiting for something to slip up, and there was nothing to put on the page. Third message, same thing again. 
At the end of the third message, he talks about there's no revival in Australia because there's no repentance. And um, on the floor that night, I thought, well, I better repent. I better repent of something. And of course, when you're self-righteous, you don't think there's anything wrong. It's so sad that you can actually get to the place that you actually think you're so right that when there's a call for repentance, no one can, I've got nothing to say sorry for. And I wished I had something to say sorry for. Every people beside me, they're howling, they're crying out. There's 500 people in the tent that night and they're crying out saying, God, I'm sorry for this. And I'm thinking, damn, I wished I'd done something wrong. I could have repented. If only I had some sin there. You know, and I'm thinking of everything. And I remember just thinking, yeah, well, I did tow a caravan up here and I was doing 120. With a caravan, it's probably a bit fast. Lord, forgive me for going fast in a caravan. <laughs> I remember, and I was thinking at that shallow level, you know. But he just kept pushing it and just kept pushing it and kept pushing it. And in the end, I, I got down on, the, on my knees and I fell to the ground. And um, I said, God, if this is real, if I'm meant to be here, I want you to help me, lead me. And all of a sudden, as I was lying on the floor, I saw the five-pointed star came up in a vision and it came up out of the ground and it was and it, it somehow linked me to the Masonic symbol. I just forgot exactly how that looked. But I thought, all of a sudden I thought, this guy's a mason. This bloke's flogging, I'm nearly deceived. How close was I to getting deceived? And I thought, this guy's a mason. God's revealing me that this guy's a mason. And just as I got that vision and thought it was just about to back off, Colloque, it says from out the front, he said, somebody's just had a vision here. I want you to know that it's come from the enemy because he's trying to stop you from coming into repentance. And I thought, okay, right, I would possibly right. You know, this is, um, this is words of knowledge. I wasn't, I didn't know this stuff very well. You know, and even, and I, we, our little house church never prayed in tongues. We were never tongue-talking people. They, you know, we were waiting on the manifestations of the Spirit, but they never came. We're very legalistic in that, so God couldn't actually flow there. Yet I often felt his love and his peace in the meetings. So I've gone back into repentance again, gone back down, and I'm thinking, God, I've got nothing to say sorry for. There's nothing. And then Colo at the same thing, he speaks again. He said, there's people here on the floor now, and you've got nothing. You're saying to yourself, you've got nothing to repent of. And I'm just, he's just fully got my attention. And he says, what about the self-sins? What about the self-justification? What about the self-righteousness? What about the self-centeredness? And every time one of those words came out, it just hit me and hit me and hit me. And I just broke on the floor and God actually showed me what I was like. And so I say I was saved at 10. I was baptised in the Holy Ghost at 21. But at 30, I was set free from myself. And all of a sudden, it was over. I came, I had about an hour on the floor probably, just ruined, crying and repenting, just so sorry for everything. My heart was broken. I yielded before the Lord and then I came into an amazing joy. And we're going to experience this in a couple of weeks when Basil Howard Brown is here. You're going to see people here laughing that haven't laughed for a long time. And I'll be one of those. But, but, the, but I came out of that meeting, I was so, so free, so on fire. Now I'd left Beth in Sydney because... Beth had said to me, if you come home from this meeting talking in tongues, don't even bother coming to pick me up. So that's how fearful she was. But the glory of the Lord was so on me that when I got to Sydney to pick her up, and I'd only stayed a few nights at Colt's meeting, I went and picked her up. And the power of God, the power of God that was flowing through my body, I remember stopping fuel bowsers with my voice. You know, I would just put a, I, I remember just putting a fuel bowser in on the way to Sydney. I remember clicking that thing on and I said, and you will stop at $30, you know, like that. And the bowser would just go bang at 30 <laughs> It was just incredible what was happening. I felt it. And when I, I remember taking, we were taking Raylene to Sydney actually. And when we took Ray to Sydney, I said, you'll be at the airport right on time. You'll be there at, you know, whatever it was. But it was right to the second. There was just such a favour that was flowing. I went and picked up Beth. And she was really nervous for the first half hour. But what she couldn't, she couldn't beat the love that was actually flowing out of the vessel. And for the first time, you know, that she'd probably ever seen that. Because all of a sudden I wasn't that self-righteous, legalistic, I'll speak, you'll listen guy. It was a whole new day. And we actually both got out to one of Harry, one of Cole's meetings when we got home. I said, will you come up for one meeting? Will you please come up for one meeting? 
And she came up. We came out of that with revival. Power of God hit us so powerfully. Revival, we came home. The little house church just blew to smithereens. She blew up. All the people left. I became a false prophet. I became, um, who did they call me? They called me uh, Absalom. They called me everything, you know, but I'd encountered God. I was every demon that you could have. I had it. I had strange fire. I was everything, you know. But we ended up passing a little church of six people. And because the pastors left and beautiful people, beautiful people taught me so much of God and we're good friends again with him today. But at that stage, it was the water was a bit rough. Um, but we came out of that encounter and that's what birthed us into the children's ministry. And that first year, we just saw hundreds and hundreds of kids come to God because the power of God was flowing through us. And I, I just want to say that tonight, that doesn't matter where you are on the journey, the, the Word of God is true, it's alive and it's living. And no matter where you are, you think, well, what's at the end of the road? The bottom line is we've already started eternity. We're on it. We're on it, friends. We're on the road of eternity and we're going to make a decision of where we end up with that eternity, whether we go to a lost or to a living place, where we're saved or we're lost. And tonight I, want to, I just want to thank God that he actually saved me. He saved me. So I was 30 at that stage. We went on year after year. Then um, we did our own ministry for a few years and we went into tent ministry. We, you know, we saw a lot of stuff happen. I met Glenn on the mountain in 95. 1995, I met him up there in a prayer meeting. It just went on and on and it just increased and increased and increased. But one of the things that I've noticed is that the closer I've got to God, the more resistance of the enemy. Don't ever get to a place, you know, the, the devil is, is relentless. He just does not quit. He doesn't get to a place and think, oh, he's too good for me, I'm going to quit. He just stays on, his, on your case and he'll just, he'll after you, after you, after you. He's relentless. He'll never quit. The only place of safety is in the cleft of the rock. It's the only place of safety. That is in Christ. When I get in him, I'm totally safe. But anything of self-effort, it's just the enemy just has full access to that and will destroy you. So here I was, you know, for nine years, baptised in the Holy Ghost and power. I saw a real change in the ministry, but never saw anybody saved. Never saw anybody in that, all, the, all those years. You know, I could talk people into Christianity, but never saw anybody saved. But after that, mate, it was never an issue to see somebody come to the Lord. You know, and we've led hundreds of people to the Lord since, since 1995. So we, when that, that's pretty much it and our journeys go on. I'll just share one more little encounter. Some of you would have encounters with God. But I remember when I was in the Solomon Islands that there was a, there was a light came and sat over my bed. We'd been in warfare for two weeks. It just felt like we were wrestling everything you know, over there, just such a, such a spiritual atmosphere. And this big light, this bright light came and sat over my bed and I, it looked like it was like I'm lying there and the light looked like it was about the size of a soccer ball and it was over me and, and it glowed the whole room up. And I just thought, this is, this is bad, this is wrong, and I've rebuked this light and in the name of Jesus, and it's gone, it disappeared. And so I thought, didn't think too much more of it. When I got home, I was watching, uh, I was listening to uh, Jesse Duplantis, listening to his little message about his visitation from God and this light that came and sat over his bed when Jesus came to his room one night. <laughs> I thought, oh, Lord, if I've rebuked you, if I've rebuked you, I'm really sorry. If that was you wanting to come and say something to me, I, I'm sorry. And I asked you if you come, come and do it again. And then I started to pray. You know, what, whatever you're really after in God, you'll find. you just got to be ready to handle it if it comes. But God will take you there if you're ready to go there. But it, I don't know how much, how much longer it was after that. Um, the, again, that light came into my bedroom and I thought that I was going to do a, you know, Jesse Planners talks about the encounter of the God kind where he went, God took him to heaven and, um, and I thought she's on that night and I was that scared, I thought I was going to die. But the room filled up with light, I had my arms out over the, I'm lying just with my arms out over the, the doona and, and all of a sudden my eyes are closed but the room filled up with light and uh, Beth sound asleep, she missed the whole thing. But this light came into the room and just glowed the room up and I was that scared. And I, I thought, this is it. I'm actually, I'm, I'm either going to die here 
and go to heaven or God's going to take me there. So I'm waiting on this. And, but all I remember is, is fear like you wouldn't believe and I just knew. I wasn't going to open my eyes, but I knew that the Lord was standing at the end of my bed and basically said to me, basically said, so you want a bit of glory, do you? You're looking for glory. You know, <laughs> and I couldn't even answer. I couldn't even take my arms. I desperately wanted to pull my arms in and put them under the covers and just hide, but I couldn't. I was frozen stiff, absolutely frozen, right? And then God's, and then I, the, the, God didn't speak. There was no voice. There was nothing. Whether it was angels or Jesus himself, I don't know. But it was that whole realm of, you want glory, do you? You're looking for glory? You, you really, you want, you want glory? You, you, are you ready for glory? That was that sort of attitude. And I'm thinking, <laughs> this flesh ain't coping good here. And all of a sudden, about uh, probably maybe 15 or 20 minutes, the light started to disperse. You know, and my fear started to come down and my, my chest was banging, my heart pumping, man. And I've, I've opened my eyes and in the corner of the room there's a little star. It's, this looks like, it just looked like a star that you would see way out there, but it was actually in my room in the lounge room and the Lord spoke to me and said this is about all you can handle <laughs> that's all you can handle man you want you want glory well this is about your limit I've got to stay this far away from you because if I give you everything you're asking <laughs> you're not going to cope well since that day I think the Lord's got closer yeah but he's had to do some adjustments on its way yeah a little star in the corner I remember going to pray it going to the prayer meeting that morning we met on the mountain and I'm just thinking, God, i got nothing. I have got nothing. You're God and I am nothing. And I think as you get older, you talk to some of these old men. That's why we love having older guys around us. You talk to the old men and they just know that there's nothing but God. There's actually nothing but Jesus. There's nothing. You know, you can think to yourself, yeah, but I'm... I'm a zealot, I can do this, I can do this for you, God. I mean, apart from him, we can do nothing. Yeah, and the sooner you can realise that, the better it'll be for you. But it seems to be that we've got to go through the journey of life to get that. Yeah. And again, many encounters from then on, but I'm now, I'm in a place where God is actually in charge. God's in control, desperately looking for the pulpit all the time when I was a zealot. Oh, give me the microphone, I'll fix this crowd. Give me a shot from the box, I'll get the lot. You know, that's how I felt, always, you know. And now people say, Tim, would you come and minister? And I say, no, 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 take them other people, I'll, be, I'll pray for you. It's just a whole new program. Yeah. I'm going to leave it there. But God is good, let's pray. Father.